It was quite surprising that even 30% of Finnish people, according to this opinion poll, sees imminent military threat coming. Üdvözlöm, ez itt a Concord Podcast. Egy műsor, ahol a Concord munkatársai minden héten alaposan megmondják véleményüket. Pénzről, gazdaságról, politikáról és mindarról, amit egy Concordos nem hagyhat szó nélkül. But on the other hand, we are not totally, we are not even closely dependent on, on Russia. Tartson velünk! A mai első angol nyelvű adásunk vendége Marko Virri úr, Finnország Budapesti nagykövete. Vele fogunk beszélgetni Finnország NATO csatlakozásáról. Kérdező társam Móró Tamás, a Concord vezető stratégája. Én Vidovszki Áron vagyok, a Concord lakosság üzletág vezetője. Finland and Sweden announced a couple of weeks ago that after more than seven decades of non-alignment, they would apply to join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. Today we're talking to His Excellency Marko Virri, the Finnish ambassador to Hungary. My co-presenter is Tomáš Moro, our chief strategist at Concord Securities. I'm Aaron Vidovsky, head of the private banking division. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. Hello. Mm. Hello, Hello Tomáš. When I examine the last hundred years of Finland's history, I have the feeling that, similar to so many other medium or small countries in Europe, it's all about balance. Finding the proper balance between two big powers, which in Finland's case was Germany and the Soviet Union before World War II, and after that between the West and the Soviet Union. And what I learned is that Finland has done this job really well. The heavily armed, non-alignment approach worked really well in the past 73 years. Would you describe what has changed so dramatically and rapidly in Finnish people's and politicians' thinking in the last couple of months that appended 73 years of this approach? Yes, that's very true, that there has been a dramatic change. In January this year, the opinion polls showed still that uh, only less than 30% of the Finnish people were in favor of the NATO membership, and that was about one month before the war in Ukraine started. But right after the start of the war, when there were new opinion polls made, more than 55% of Finnish people showed their favor towards the NATO membership. So the dramatic change happened with the link to this start of the war. And now the latest polls show that even 75% of Finnish people are in favor of NATO membership. But if you look at the bigger picture and um, some decades backwards to the 90s, early 90s, when the Cold War was over, already then Finnish people and Finnish governments showed some readiness towards military alliance because we adopted something we called a NATO option. So in the government programs, regardless which political side the government were, they all made in the program the mention about NATO option, meaning that Finland wants to reserve itself a possibility to apply it to NATO membership if needed. So basically it meant that uh, you were applying NATO standards in your uh, military equipment, things like that. So you were kind of aligning in terms of technical capabilities and issues with NATO without explicit membership. Yes, we started close cooperation with NATO right in the early 90s and it has deepened during these 30 years all the time and we are now totally compatible with NATO militarily, politically and in any way. So we are not expecting long negotiations in, on our NATO membership on these issues. By Finland remain non-aligned, as you discussed, it didn't mean neglecting your army. On the contrary, the Finnish army is one of the most capable in Europe, um, at least compared to the population. So what was the strategy behind this? You were always a little bit afraid of, of Russia or... or Yes, you are, you are right. Um, the, the Finnish defense forces are very strong. And not only compared to the size of our population, but also in absolute terms mm. in, in Europe. We have one of the strongest defense forces, although we are a rather small nation. Yes, you are right. I mean, we can put it in many ways. One way to put it uh, is in the words of a former Finnish defense minister who made a speech in Washington more than 10 years ago, and he was asked that uh, if he could name three biggest threats to Finnish security. And his answer was first uh, Russia, second Russia, and the third Russia. 
Yeah, that's very straightforward. <laughs> that was very straightforward. But um, this somehow describes the geostrategic position of Finland. We have a long, long border with Russia, more than 1,300 kilometers. Also, I mean, why we have such strong defense forces? It's, of course, we think that we need strong defense forces to to defend our independence, our sovereignty. Our approach is also the so-called concept of total defense. It means that we need it necessary to be ready to defend all Finland. And that needs a lot of lot of forces because in European standards we are a rather large country although although we are small by population. What probably uh, most of the people don't know in Hungary, actually I was a little bit surprised as well, but it, it says really a lot about Finland's approach that uh, the military service is still mandatory in, in Finland. And there's also a strong reservist force, a very strong reservist yes. force. So it's completely different from what you have in other European countries right now. Exactly, yes. Our system is, we, we have this conscription system. I'm sure that we will always have it, whether we are members of NATO or not. We need to remain with, with that. Uh, that's clear. And I think, by the way, that NATO had something against it. On the contrary, it's also good for NATO, I would say. Conscription system, yes, it means in, in practical terms that every Finnish man does his military service around at the age of 19 years. And uh, that also allows us to have this huge reserve, as you, as you mentioned. Our strength of our wartime forces is 280,000, but we have a reserve of about 900,000. That's really a, a large number. Yeah, just in comparison, the Russian army that attacked the Ukraine was like suffering at 200,000. So compared to this, even the regular Finnish army... Um, Which is 280,000? Yeah, and then, it's, 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 yeah, it's a huge number. That's 280,000. Actually, it's a so-called wartime strength. They are not uh, professional soldiers, but they are trained, conscripted soldiers that are in the first reserve. Uh -huh. In addition to them, we have almost 900,000 more of reservists between age of uh, 18 and 60. One of the uh, most significant issues of uh, Finland and Sweden being a NATO member is the uh, Turkish opposition and, and the Turkish uh, politicians, especially the Turkish president, says that uh, they are opposing your membership for various reasons, which may or may not be that true. So how do you see the, the Turkish uh, opposition to your membership? Is it, uh, is it a hurdle that can be overcome or is it a more difficult step to, to make? Well, first of all, I, I, would, I would like to express my, my thanks for the strong support shown to our NATO membership bid by, by our EU and NATO partners. And also Turkey has supported this NATO's open door policy and has earlier indicated support to Finland's membership. So against this background, the recent developments have been surprising, I, I have to say. And now the North Atlantic Council and the Allies need to have their own discussions and process Finland's application. And um, I, I presume this will take its time. As regards to Turkish statements recently, it's understandable that uh, in these kind of processes, different issues may be raised by different stakeholders. And um, it's important that the possible uh, security concerns of all NATO member states will be addressed. That's, that's clear, of course. Turkey has raised its security concerns, including related to the PKK, that is considered as a terrorist organization in the EU. Finland condemns terrorism in all its forms, and also organizations su such as the PKK are considered as terrorist organizations also in Finland. We have been in active contact with Turkey at different levels regarding our NATO membership bid, and we wish to continue our constructive dialogue and are ready to discuss the outstanding issues with Turkey. Uh, I, I can tell you that 
today's newspapers tell that uh, the Finnish delegation is right now, today, in Ankara, having those discussions with with Turkey. And I can I can also add that the bilateral relations between our two countries have been and and are well functioning, and uh, there are several areas of common interest. And I believe it's in our mutual interest to find constructive ways forward. So that tells me that we can be optimistic that this will not be a hurdle for uh, for Finland. And we are optimistic in in that, and and we trust that uh, in the end we, we will find solutions with this issue as well. Back to Russia for for a sec. Do you see any imminent threat? Or as the Russian conventional army got significantly weakened in Ukraine, the threat is not credible anymore? The Finnish government's view is that there is no imminent military threat right now targeted to to Finland. I just happened to read this morning in the Finnish newspaper a new opinion poll. There are many opinion polls made in Finland nowadays related to the, to these questions. And, and they namely asked about this threat from the Russia, from Finnish people. And it was quite surprising that even 30% of Finnish people, according to this opinion poll, sees imminent military threat coming. And it also said that um, as regards to other types of threat, let's say hybrid cyber threats, about 76% sees this kind of threats imminent. 76% of the people fear that cyber attacks can come. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I think that's, that's one, one area where the Russians are really excelling. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they like to do that. Yes, yes. And they have done that already so far. So this wouldn't be any kind of surprise for anyone. Before the podcast, we were talking about that we all like history a lot. And I have a theoretical question, which can be surprising for you. But let me ask this. You had a legendary general, marshal and president Carl Gustav Emil von Mannerheim. What is his political legacy, if there is any? What would he do in this situation? Yes, I would say that his legacy is is more than political. It's overwhelming. When Finnish people are asked who is the most remarkable figure in our history or in Finland in all times, he is always number one and by far the others come far away somewhere so he has a very very strong legacy which is due to of course his doings what what he has done for finland firstly related to our independence in 1917 1918 he led the white army who win the red side and in this way guaranteed the independence of Finland or or Finland's status as an independent state first time in history. And then during the Second World War, of course, he was the the head of our defense forces and later on in the aftermath of the of the war, he was even elected the president of the republic. Well, answering to your Second question, he was the one who really knew the Russians because he served the Imperial Russian Army for 30 years, since he was 20 years in 1887 until uh, the years of the First World War in 1917 before coming back to Finland. He knew Russians very well, and I think that he haven't had any difficulties to find the right way even today. I think that I don't need to say anything more. He certainly knew the opposite side of the uh, of this potential conflict. Yeah. Yes. Okay, there's the other issue of the of the energy supply and just a couple of days ago Russia ceased transporting natural gas to Finland and also um, cut power exports to Finland and I know that you just inaugurated a new nuclear power plant in March, so that can really help. So how do you see the energy security of Finland in light of all these all these developments? Yes, this is, of course, a very important question. I mean, there are nowadays five nuclear power plants units working in Finland, and they produce about one-fifth of, of our energy consumption 
and uh, about one-fourth of our electricity consumption. Almost 30% of the nuclear fuel used in these nuclear power plants comes from Russia. So it's not a significant share, I, I would say. Then again, if we talk about the natural gas, 100% of our natural gas comes from Russia. And crude oil, 90% of the crude oil comes from Russia. If we talk about import of energy, so Russia is quite significant importer of different kinds of, especially gas and, and oil. But on the other hand, if we think about the energy consumption in Finland, then, for example, the share of natural gas is only 5%. Although we are totally dependent on, on Russia as regards to, to the import of, of the gas, anyway, the only 5% yeah. of uh, energy consumption goes to or is, is, is of natural gas. So there are, of course, some concerns. This is not an easy thing at in any ways. But on the other hand, we are not totally, we are not even closely dependent on, on Russia so, uh, as, as regards to ener energy so sources. So do you think this issue is manageable? I think it's manageable, yes, yes. We have experienced uh, a similar kind of situations, not actually related to energy so closely, but if we talk about trade in general, when Soviet Union collapsed and its significance for Finland's trade uh, still in the late 80s was quite big. It was in top three of our trade partners. So when, when Soviet Union collapsed, also our trade with Russia collapsed and we needed to find new trade partners and we survived. We, we yeah. did find. I, I remember because that was the age when Nokia really started to develop in the 1990s exactly. and that was a kind of a technology was one of the uh, one of the new ways of Finland's economy to grow after the collapse of the Soviet Union and trade with the Soviet Union. Exactly, yes. So we can say that Finland gets used to this situation because you had similar situations before, not even once, but twice or three times in the last one yes, years. Yes, yes. So it's and, nothing and as new. A, it's nothing new. And, and as I said, we are not dependent on Russia, energy-wise either. So I'm pretty sure that we can fill those gaps with energy sources from other countries. Let me ask you about trade with Russia in general, mm. because I think you still had quite a significant trade relationships uh, with Russia, and I guess they are now completely cut off. Yes. Probably. Yes. Is there any interaction between the two countries right now? Or it's We can just say that it's completely ceased. According to information I have received, it's, it's quite completely ceased. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia's significance to our trade, it's not vital. Uh, Russia has been as an export target in the fifth place, and its share of the value of our exports is about five or six percent, uh, slightly uh, more than, for example, to China. But it's clearly after Germany, Sweden, United States and the Netherlands, which are the fourth, fourth biggest ones. Imports, Russia is, is number three. I think energy plays a pretty big role in that sense. So Russia's role, it's, it's not insignificant, but it's not vital either. So I'm, I'm sure that we will find once again new or fill those gaps quite easily in the, in the yeah. coming months and years. I think if you want to survive the Finnish winter anyway, you have to be tough and, and, and <laughs> resilient, right? So. <laughs> That's true. Back to the security issues. Mm -hmm. I read um, somewhere in the last week that there are underground shelters for 4 million people in Finland, which is really a great number. Is this part of, a, of the security concept? Yes, it is part of that total defense uh, security concept. We have considered it necessary to build those shelters. They have been built during decades. Of course, the experiences of the Second World War and the bombings of different Finnish cities by Soviet Air Force has had significant impact on that that policy. To us Finns, actually, these shelters are, I mean, well known and, and we take it as given or as granted. But now I, I also understand now that they are something quite uh, exceptional. And this is not the case in, in every country and actually probably in, in very few countries. 
Yes, unfortunately, yes. And just one more thing, because I read another th- interesting thing, that the whole population is uh, getting prepared psychologically, not just for a war, but any kind of serious accident like this. So Finland has been focusing through the educational system to, to get prepared psychologically. I mean, all the people, if, even already from young age. Is that true? Uh, well, there is no military training in Finnish schools, I, I can tell you. But, uh, I mean, the program in the schools, it's quite wide. And many kind of uh, skills, citizen skills, are taught for children. So, and, and I mean, those skills are, they are not necessarily anything sp- special or specific. They are normal, everyday things that are good to be known and are good to be command. So if there are some tough times at some point of time, you can do yourself a lot. So the the first thing you don't need to do is to find help, but you can start to do yourself many things in order to your own security and your family's security and, and so on. That's very impressive for me to tell the truth. Let me ask you about any personal relationships between the two countries, because in the case of Ukraine, of course, there's a lot of family and other relationships between Russians and Ukrainians, intermarriages, anything. In the case of Finland, is there anything, of course, not on a similar scale, but something like that? Is it something that exists or it's not really uh, significant? They exist, but I would say not significantly. Of course, there are intermarriages, Most of those have happened during the last 30 years, of course. But the scale, as you said, it's nothing comparable. It's, it's, it's at all with the scale between Ukraine and, and Russia. I was just asking that uh, regarding any potential threat by Russia to defend the, the Russian population in Finland. I know that, you know, it is something that can be can be created as a reason for for doing something like that. Of course, with the NATO membership, that would be very difficult to do anyway, but that was just uh, the reason for my question. Well, if I may comment, after the collapse of Soviet Union, there has been some influx of Russian people to, to Finland. I mean, some Russians have moved to Finland. I think that uh, the number of Russian-speaking population nowadays is something like 70 I have to check that number, but but it, it, it's around of that figure, mm-hmm. so that's the fact nowadays. I, but it's so that is that is not a very big minority. So if I count well, it's about one and a half percent of the whole population, something like that. Yes, something like that. Yeah. And um, how do people generally feel about Russia these days? Of course, this um, attack against Ukraine has changed also uh, the opinions of Finnish peoples on, on Russia quite a lot. I think nowadays people don't have a very nice picture on Russia, I have to say. But on the other hand, I, I would like to say that Russia has made it itself difficult and and it's understandable that that opinions of people towards Russia change. I, I think this is rather general phenomenon in all Europe, for example, probably wider as, as well. Well, we of course want to live in peace with Russia. We want to got back these periods, I mean, after the, or in the 90s and early 2000 when when we had uh, good possibilities to cooperation and we had very constructive relations and uh, very profitable trade relations for both sides. So, so yeah. th- this is what we want. Yeah, that was the time when Russia opened up to the world anyway in the early 2000 years. So that was that was something that uh, you know everyone expected Russia to become an integrated member of the world economy. And in those years, they really become that. So, but then times changed. So here comes the next question. I know it's very difficult to answer. How do you see your your relationships with Russia down the road in light of all what happened in the Ukraine, the war, and all uh, the uh, political and military problems that arose. So is there any chance of, of um, being on better terms with Russia or in the current political system in Russia just doesn't make it possible? Well, I, I see our relationship with Russia in the long term going on the same way 
like our relationship has gone throughout the history. So there are ups and downs. Sometimes there are times of war. Sometimes there are longer periods of peace. It has always been like that. And uh, fortunately, we have succeeded in living since the Second World War, a long period of peace. Now Russia has shaken this stability. It has started the war uh, with Ukraine. We really hope that this war will be ended soon so that Ukraine will stay independent and sovereign country. And we also hope that this war will not be escalated to anywhere else. So I'm pretty sure that that in the longer term we are going to see again a more peaceful time, better times when we can cooperate with Russia better, have good trade relations. But I also think that this is not going to happen soon and with this kind of politics that Russia has adopted now. Ez itt a Concord Podcast, egy műsor, ahol a Concord munkatársai minden héten alaposan megmondják véleményüket pénzről, gazdaságról, politikáról és mindarról, amit egy Concordos nem hagyhat szó nélkül. Mr. Ambassador Marco Birri, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you.